from climate change to changing of the basically the the aging aspect and how the US is aging both of those topics today on the data show Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Data Show. Uh, my name is Chris Greco. I'm here for the next 30 minutes to try to discuss some areas of data, uh, data analysis, uh, you know, how, how the media can take the data and uh, try to put us into a panic mode with that type of data aspect. And they do it every single day. It's, it's absolutely amazing to see the minute that's, that one of the talking heads talks about a study, that it, it just it, it piques my interest. I take a look at it and just, you know, kind of ha ha through it because they're reading off a, off a teleprompter, of course, uh, heaven forbid that they should, uh, they should ad lib. And when they do ad lib, it just doesn't add anything to it. So it's just amazing how these types of things go on and we kind of let it happen and it's, it, it engages in panic. And one of the things that really, really engages in panic is absolutely uh, climate change. And I think that this is, you know, the one thing that has brought that up is uh, things like uh, the Washington Post. So the Washington Post, uh, let's talk about that for a second. Earth is at its hottest in thousands of years. Here's how we know. Good for you, Scott Dance. I'm really glad that you, you know, you're with this Washington Post aspect. Uh, so I don't blame, I, I kind of blame the media because they take this stuff and they kind of run with it, but they don't. You, you know, all people read are like the headlines. They call it clickbait, where you sit back and you go, oh, look at this. You know, look, the hottest, Earth is the hottest ever. Oh, my God, what are you going to do? So it's, and you sit back and you go, um, first of all, let me, let me say something right off the bat about science, right? Science is based on probabilities. And, and the, you know, the, the scientists that are doing these types of studies, they don't, they, they don't bring out the fact that this is all probability aspects. That the things, you know, statistical significance and all the things go along with that. They're just saying, oh, this is happening. Well, as you read through this and you read through these areas, you're going to say, you know, observations from both satellites and Earth's surface are indisputable. Planet has warmed rapidly over the past 44 years. Now, understand a couple of things. First of all, the sampling has to be the same. So if you're saying that you're doing this, and you're doing it in a specific area and you're sampling with specific set of samples, then that's okay. You can do that. And that's very consistent. But if the sampling is different for whatever reason, and the sampling is taken different for whatever reason, that can bias your sampling, which can bias your data. Bad sampling, bad data. That's the way it goes. So, you know, and they say observations from both satellites and their surface are indisputable. That's true from the standpoint that that specific surface temperature, that specific surface area measured by satellites, you know, we can we can go on and on about this stuff. You know, yes, I will I will concede that climate is changing as it always has. Let me let me make something very clear here. Change is inevitable because humans change things. Even when we study them, we change things. Let me give you an example. Um, the satellite that currently reads temperature, that currently reads the weather, how was that put up there? How was that satellite put into orbit? That satellite was put into orbit from a rocket. That rocket, that rocket put tons and tons and tons of particulates and pollutants into the air for that one launch that one launch. So basically by putting that satellite up there to read temperature, the, the, the launch itself changed climate. It changed, well, weather. A lot of people sit there, especially as some of the, some of the quasi scientists sit back and go, weather and climate are different. Well, climate is over a period of time, but weather is a snapshot of that period of time. Climate and weather are related. Let me make that very clear. Look it up. Climate and weather are related. So anybody wants to any look if anybody that wants to take me on on that, please absolutely. Uh, let me give you let me give you my email again that nobody uses. 
So evidently, it must not be many people who, who listen to the show, but basically, there's my email. You Give me an email. Say, Chris, you're full of crap, but just don't tell me I'm full of crap, right? Tell me why. You know, here's a study, Chris, that shows this and this and this. Or here's this. Let me take a look at it. Uh, you know, I'll put on the show. You know, but that, but this is what happens. So I love it. It says, in recent days, in recent days, as the Earth has reached its highest average temperature in recorded history. Now, again, <laughs> it may well be warmer than any time in the last 125,000 years. May well be warm. Doesn't say it is. May well be warmer. So this is all. So this is what it goes on, and they talk about how they, these guys do it, and they blah 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 blah. But it says it says something very very important, and that is you know you go through the the different you go through these charts and whatever else. But this is really important here. It says for a period going back about two thousand years, scientists and historians have used artifacts and geologic observations to piece together climate patterns and extreme events on a scale from decades. To single years. Good. Unfo unfortunately, that's unfalsifiable. And I've used this term before, but I'm going to use it now. It's unfalsifiable. I cannot falsify those. I can't falsify what they say. I can't, you know, if they give me the data that they use, I either have to go out and get different data or I have to, you know, I can't falsify what they tell me. They're just going to tell me something. It's like, this is why we did it. This is how we did it. This is our methodology. And you sit back and you go, all I can do is basically do the same thing you just did. So it's, I mean, you know, I, oh, well, that corroborates our story. Yeah, on your methodology. So it's it's the situation where we're kind of stuck in these in these areas. They can't pinpoint the year the fern became trapped in sediment, but they, they can pinpoint the year that the fern became trapped in sediment. For example, fossil oil fern found beneath glacier could tell science the conditions that were once much warmer. Really? Really? They don't know anything about that fern, nothing except it's fossilized. They don't know. I mean, maybe it adjusted to that. Maybe it could take, maybe it could take those types of chills, right? Maybe it could take those types of, of, of cold weather aspect. I mean, I'm just pointing this stuff out. It's unfalsifiable, folks. I can't falsify it. Um, but they can get a sense how long the climate patterns were such that the fern could grow in a given spot. Yes, that specific fern, which they know nothing about. Nothing about it except it's fossilized. How do, how do they know what type of fern that was? How do they know what type of temperature? Oh, it's just I mean, it's stuff like this that just angers me. So it says, it, um, confident that apart from global warming of recent decades, it was Earth's warmest period in the past 100,000 years. They're confident. How confident are they? Well, this again goes to probability. They could be 95% confident, right? Well, you know, that's it. Uh, they estimate the temperature's average somewhere between 0, 2 degrees Celsius and 1 degree Celsius. That is a heck of a difference. 0. 0.2 degrees Celsius and 1 degree Celsius. Warmer than they were from 1850 to 1900. I mean, that's, uh, yeah, okay, you know, we'll go with that. I mean, during the past 6,000 years, warmth was largely a result of fluctuations in the north orbits, with this, it which is elliptical rather than circular. Uh, okay. You know, astronomy again, you know, you do what you need to do to be able to make that work. But again, it's 6,000 years. I, I, I mean, nobody can go back there. Nobody can figure out exactly what happened. They're just, they're just making, yeah. Okay. They're making guesses. Now it could be intelligent guesses, but it's guesses nonetheless. Um, it's funny. It says that makes some paleoclimatologists reluctant to say for sure that this week produces the hottest single days in more than hundred thousand years. That conclusion is certainly plausible, but technically without 120,000 years of daily temperature becomes a plausibility argument rather than a definitive argument. Plausibility argument rather than a definitive argument. Again, we're talking about probabilities. Probabilities. It's the, the major aspect about statistics is probabilities. That's why it's always statistics and probability. That's why everybody goes, oh, I don't mind the statistics portion, but the probability kills me. Well, guess what? They're both linked. You don't have one, you don't have the other. This, this right here is, is plausible, okay? Plausible, not definitive. Plausible, not definitive. And I think that's really important. So, I mean, and it says, unlike any previously previous warm period, this one was caused by people. Well, you know, it's interesting that you state that, but with, with the warming, you know, what about the dinosaurs? You know, what about, yeah, I mean, 
and and again, we're making a lot of guesses about dinosaurs. But who says that dinosaur? And and this is this is going to come off as being like I'm kind of wacko, but I'm just going to throw this out here. What are we making guesses? We're making guesses about dinosaurs. Oh, dinosaurs were this, and they did this, and they did this, and they did this. Who says that? Who says they weren't actually civilized? Oh, they didn't have cities. They didn't have transportation. They have a oh, there's no, there's no, you know, there's no um, evidence that there was transportation. Let, let me tell you something. Um, you want to see? We want to read a good book, and I've said this before, and I'm going to say it again. Um, read the Weans. Um, great book. It is. It is great book. It's called the Weans. I mean, literally the Weans. You want a book about you know the the uh, the the idea of um, uh, sorry. This is. This is this is a climate.gov uh, thing. I, I'm going to throw this out here right now. That talks about what hottest, you know, what's hottest Earth has ever been, that type of thing. So if you want to go to a, a government website, at, yes, absolutely, go go to there, you know, and and that that would be great. So um, the Weans, I was going to say the Weans, right? It's a book that was done in 1960. Um, fantastic book. I really, really, really recommend you get it. Unfortunately, they don't have it. I don't think they have it in Kindle. You have to actually go to Amazon and buy it. But, but basically, it's a great. It's really, really a good book. I oh, know. I take that back. They do have it in Kindle edition. Uh, I I got it back when I was in middle school, and uh, it was just well, middle school then junior high school. Actually, my yeah, I think it was seventh grade, and it was just fantastic. So absolutely, go back and re read this if you want to see the 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 fallibility of these types of studies. This is really, really a good one to be able to look at that. Plausible, not definitive. He doesn't say not. He says it's a plausibility argument rather than a definitive statement. So I think that's important and that's something to, to, to talk about. So here's another one. Here's one from uh, physics.org, phys.org, roughly warmest in about 100,000 years. People put this stuff out and it's like, People sit back and they go, oh my God, you know, what do we do? What do we do? What do we do? You know, climate is changing. That's, that's the way it is. I, I love, I, I love the climate change people. Um, and I shouldn't call them people. They're just like the people that have a passion. Good for them, you know, but they're standing out there talking about climate change and how we need to change and how we need to do this and stop using fossil fuels and stop doing this. And they're sitting out there in shirts that you cannot make with anything machine looming and machine looming you can't do except with steel and you can't produce steel except with fossil fuels or nuclear that's it those are the only two areas that can produce enough heat to be able to produce steel or aluminum those are the only two things that can produce steel or aluminum i mean let me say it one more time because it just it doesn't make any sense and I, hey again i gave you my email bust me on this you think of another way of being able to do this besides besides fossil fuel and aluminum to be able to produce steel I am all ears. I'm all ears because man, we're talking about 2000, 3000 degrees Fahrenheit. You, you gotta, you, you can't produce that with solar. You cannot produce it with wind. Let me, let me point out again, cannot produce it with solar, cannot produce it with wind. There's only two, two areas. And people told me geothermal. I'll have to take that look at that. Cause I don't think that's true either, but basically it's, I think it's fossil fuel and nuclear. Those are the only two that can produce enough heat to be able to make steel. Without steel, you can't produce this. You can't produce, you can't produce just about anything. You can need steel to be able to do machining, to be able to do what needs to be done. You can't, it just can't, it just can't, you can't just poop. Here you go, man. I'm gonna poop out a uh, a shirt for you. It doesn't work that way. It never will work that way. So unless we find, and I'm sure you know, somebody's gonna come up with it. Somebody's gonna come up with it. Um, that's gonna be a nice, clean energy that will produce plenty of heat. It will be able to, to be able to take those places. But let's stop trying to fool ourselves into thinking that we can go throughout life without fossil fuel. It is not going to work. And China, the number one producer of carbon dioxide in, in you know for manufacturing, is not going to quit. And India just found coal, I mean, not found the use of coal, and they're producing steel. Guess what? They're, you know, but they're a developing country, so, and so is China. You know, interestingly enough, so they're going to sit there and say, "Well, we don't have to. We don't have to stop doing this." So, I mean, it goes on and on and on, folks. It's just, it's an amazing, an amazing feat when we talk about this. So that goes there, and then, you know, so when we talk about, you know, the the, the earth, earth is Earth is is what we have it. You know, then that's what we have. So I'm going to just uh, stop it real quick. I'm going to just punch on this thing. 
and see if it'll actually do it for me. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's a situation where you have one after another, after another, after another, after another, and it just, it kills you. You know, it just is really, it's, it's not the, you know, the greatest thing in the world from the standpoint of being able to do that. So, um, I'm going to see if this will actually work here. Study Earth's roughly warmest in about 100,000 years. And like I said, this was from phys.org, and they talked about this. Uh, Snyder based her, rec her reconstruction on 61 different sea surface temperature proxies from across the globe. Ratios between magnesium, calcium, species, whatever it is. 61 sampling areas. So let's talk about this. You know, we always talk about sampling. 61 different sea surface temperature proxies from across the globe. So went to 61 different areas. Is that enough? Is that enough? Considering 72% of the world is water, right? 72% of the world is basically oceans. Went to 61 different sea surface temperature proxies from across the globe. I don't know. I don't know if that's enough. But I mean, it's, I guess it's better than 10, you know, so that's, but then, you know, but the further study goes back in time, especially the fewer the, of those proxies are available, making the estimates less certain. Okay. So it's, so why a half a million years? You know, why a half a million years? Why 500,000 years? Why not 200,000 years? So, I mean, it's, you know, temperatures averaged out over the most recent 5,000 years, 125 years or so of industrial emissions, it goes on and on, uh, carbon dioxide levels. Uh, four outside praise the study's tracking. Um, and it's interesting, but many of the same scientists say Snyder's estimate of future warming seems too high. Uh, so it seems unrealistic and not matching historical time periods of similar carbon dioxide levels. Calls the study provocative and interesting, but he says it remains skeptical until more research confirms it. He found the future temperature calculations so much higher than the prevailing estimates that one has to consider it somewhat of an outlier. So it's it's interesting how these scientists are are you know saying hey you know what's going on there. So if we the Washington Post there, and then a paleoclimate scientist explains why he cringes at the one hundred thousand year heat and how far back in prehistory it was. So this is from Fortune. So this is actually a, a you know a, a, clim a paleoclimatologist, right? And he says, you know, he says uh, right here um, that I cringe at the inexact headlines. While this claim may well be correct, there are no detailed temperature records extending back 100,000 years, so we don't know for sure. This right here. There are no detailed temperatures. This is from Fortune magazine. This is paleoclimatologist, right? Back 100,000 years, so we don't know for sure. We don't know for sure. Well, media does because they're throwing it out there just like it's, you know, like it's a, a fact. It's not a fact. Not a fact. It's not a proven fact. It is statistically, probably, you know, we're talking about probability aspects here. And the further back you go, the less exact it is. You go back 100,000 years, cut me a break. And again, it's unfalsifiable. I can't, I can't falsify this data. I can't. So this is, this is what's happening with that. So now let's talk about aging, right? Let's talk about the aging aspect for a second. And let's see how we can, let's see how we can uh, do that better. So we're going to, to present a little bit of a, uh, we're going to see if this thing will actually come up, uh, Excel. And we're going to talk about Excel from the standpoint of, of what's going on there. See if it actually come up here. So this is an Excel spreadsheet, which you're about to see in a few seconds here, hopefully. Um, and basically what it is, is it's a, um, I, I took census data. And what I did was I took a look at the number of people that are going to be 65 and older, 65, 74, 75, 80, 84, all that, all the way up to 100 with three years, 2000, 2010, 2020. So what did I find? Well, I found that here's how many 65 to 74 year olds there are, right? In, in 2000, there was about 12 million. 
Now there is 33 million. So in a matter of 20 years, we've increased this by what, 20 million people? You know, so it's what, 16, 17, 16, about 15 million. So 15 million people in 20 years. So what's happening is the United States is getting older. And as we're getting older, there are things that we have to take a look at and that climate change is part of that is, is the, you know, how's that going to affect us? Well, you know, if we start saying we're not going to go with people, go with uh, countries that have, don't have good climate change policies, there's going to be problems because India and China produce our drugs and guess who takes most of the drugs. It's going to be people that are over 65. We're going to need four physical therapists. We're going to need Medicare, Social Security, all these things as people get older. And how much, how much older that, you know, what's, what's it look like in the future? Well, what's it look like in the future is something like this. So here is, here is what it looks like age 65 plus over a period of 20 years. And you can see this thing is really kicking off. This red line is basically a polynomial line that shows that if I took another year, whatever it was, it would show me the future using this formula right here. R squared is one, which means it it almost matches this line right here. And that blue line is the um, is the uh, um, you know this is. Let me see if I can move the chart here so it's uh, so it's bigger. You guys can actually see it. So. This is what you have. You have the blue line here, which shows the different, you know, uh, the different years here. So 2010, it was 40 million, right? Age 65 plus. At at 2020, there's 55 million. So 15 million in a period of you know 20 years. And this this line right here is the trend line, and it shows that trend line going up, and it could it could actually go up even more so in the future. The way to do that is to um, is to take a look at it to forecast, and you can do a forward. You can do forward by one one period here, um, and it'll actually it'll actually tell you what it's going to be. That's just one period. So in ten years, in ten years, what are we talking about? In ten years, we're talking about eighty thousand over eighty thousand people. <coughs> if the curve continues, eighty thousand people. In 10 years, so by 2030, we're going to have 80, 80 or 80,000, 80 million people that are going to be over the age of 65. 80 million people. So that is that is something we have to take a look at, and we have to, we have to say, look, what, you know, what is it that we need to do to be able to to make this work? And I think that's very very important from that standpoint. So this is this is what we have, and it's something that is very important. To be able to understand, and uh, you know, and people sit back and they go, "Well, that's fine, Chris, but what about percentages?" Well, here, here we have what they call density analysis. It is, um, if I take it, if I take it this way. So in the year, so in the year two thousand, we had about two hundred eighty-one million people. Uh, I took the consideration the total age sixty-five plus thirty-four million. And I got a percentage of 12%. Then here's 13% for 2010 and 2020, 17%. So it's grown from 12% to 17% of the world's of the US population that is going to be over 65. I mean, there's a lot of issues here. And and that is going to be something that, you know, I mean, and everyone talks about, well, you know, what are we talking about? Well, developments for one. You know, you're going to have to put in more senior housing or you're going to have to put in uh, housing that's uh, adaptable to individuals with possible disabilities. I mean, all these things are, are part of the cost of or part of the cause of climate change. And everybody sits back and they said, you know, climate change can be can be mitigated. Well, maybe it all depends how much people want to change. I mean, look how many cars there are. You know, you could, you know, you can, you can actually look that up. You can figure out, you know, n number of cars uh, in the in the U.S. 
and I think an EPA probably has that. I'm sure um, they they were they were really good about that. So automobile probably a number of vehicles involved in crashes. Don't want that. Um, so I mean, but but let's take a look at that. Let's take a look at the uh, you know the number of I mean automobile profiles. So um, you know let's let's just take a look quickly at that and see if see if we can actually take a look at what we have. So, um, so what we'll do is, is we will stop this, move that, take this. I'll uh, stop screen there. Take this and we'll share screen and we'll see what the window says. Automobiles, see if it'll actually come up. And there it is. So automobile profile, personal automo personal auto expenditure, total millions of dollars. So, I mean, this is 1960, 1960 to 2021. So millions of dollars, millions. That means <laughs> if this goes into millions of dollars, then we have to add, I mean, we're talking here billions. I mean, look at this. I mean, it went all the way from basically millions of dollars. It's you have to add a million onto this. So I mean, it's a, it's a lot, a lot of a lot of of cars. So two two thousand six hundred seventy two million. So you're talking about billions. I mean, it's it's a good bit number of vehicle registrations. I mean, vehicle miles. I mean, look at the miles that we're doing. Five and millions in millions, okay, per year. So we're talking about billions here. I mean, we're talking about, uh, you know, we're talking about a lot of miles. Look at this. So if I take this, right? If I take this and I, and I sit back and I go, okay, I'm gonna uh, take this and, and put millions on the back of this. <laughs> That's a lot of miles, folks. That's a lot of miles. Millions. This is yeah. So we're talking about trillions here. I mean, it's just it's an amazing amount of miles that we're putting on in every year. So uh, you know, what do we do to to be able to and and people sit back and they go, well, it'll go away whenever we talk about age aspects. Maybe, maybe, maybe not, because all of a sudden you're gonna you're gonna have this situation where you're gonna be you're gonna be dependent upon more and more transportation. So now that you can do by solar, that you can do by, you know, different different types of batteries, those types of things, as long as battery efficiency comes up. So that that actually can you can you can make that change. But again, all that stuff's got to be charged up. Then you got to make sure that everything is charged up every night. Use up a lot of electricity. Electricity produced by what at this point? A lot of fossil fuel. Does it have to be? No, it can be used by nuclear. It can be used by um, uh, hydroelectric, those types of things. So there are there are areas we can correct, but there are areas that we're just it's going to be very very difficult to correct. The wind uh, the wind farms that they're all done with steel. You can't produce those wind propellers without steel. You can't produce steel without fossil fuel. So it goes around and around. So that's that's basically the age aspect. But what I want to do is is the more that we have from the standpoint of age, the more that we have for activities for that. And what I wanted to do is just show you real quick. Uh, there was an individual that was involved in the Maryland Senior Olympics, and she had Parkinson's disease, and she was being supported by individuals both in the stands as well as. Uh, be courageous. So, this is, you know, this is something that is you know, <laughs> an announcer from the Senior Olympics, and basically she's walking with the individual. And I think this shows, I mean, I love the Maryland Senior Olympics. And I just wanted to give a little shout out to the Maryland Senior Olympics people for making that, for making that uh, available. And they are just, you know, fantastic. I highly recommend anybody who wants to go up there and participate in that, participate in that. It's very, it's very competitive, but it is a lot of fun. And um, that just about does it for me for today. I wanted to say thank you so much for, for listening to the data show, data show. And please, please, please have a very safe 
and healthy rest of the week. Uh, and by all means, and every time, please check the data. <laughs>